Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, I'll help moderate those uh, time allowing. Programs of the NIU Art Museum are sponsored in part by the Illinois Arts Council Agency through federal funds provided by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Friends of the NIU Art Museum, the College of Visual and Performing Arts season presenting sponsor, Shaw Media, and the NIU Arts and Culture Fee. I'm going to turn my screen over to Museum Director Joe Burke now for our presentation this afternoon. All right, thank you, Stuart. And thank you all for coming. I, isn't it nice to see everyone? <laughs> so there may be more joining us, um, but I want to um, share some of the exhibition that we have because not everybody can get here. This is so frustrating. Um, because we knew you couldn't all come to the gallery and we wanted to do some kind of gallery view. Um, so this is a glimpse into the current exhibition and other work by Ellen Ross Deutsch. Now, from what I've seen already, many of you are family <laughs> and beloved friends. And so you may already know a lot of this. And in some ways I would have loved to have you guys do all the talking, but we'll try this with me giving it a shot and you can correct me later, how's that? So um, I wanted to give you this gallery view of this exhibition, which we called From the Mind of Ellen Roth Deutsch. And um, I can give you this chaotic view um, and I'll try to get this to make some other sense, all right? So our galleries, um, we're over in this old castle building on campus, the original building on um, NIU's campus in DeKalb. And so it's a crazy multi-spaced room with turrets and curves and um, unfortunately also foot and a half thick walls. And so even if we tried to do a virtual program from within the gallery, I don't know if it would even work. So I'm in Michigan right now, Stuart's at home, and you all are all over the world. <laughs> so welcome to the NIU Art Museum. Um, so on the left of this slide, you should see the banner that we have out in our hallway and scattered around campus um, in various uh, departments that are working um, in person for some of the um, classes. Not everything is remote right now. A lot of our um, studio and science type classes, you've got to be there in person from time to time. So we have a little bit of um, campus activity. Anyway, we ended up doing a winter narrative suite. Um, Herb had approached me, I didn't even realize how soon after Ellen's death, um, but probably within two months, he contacted me and said, hey, you know, a lot of Ellen's artist friends were talking about, can we do a, um, a retrospective? And I'm like, Herb, I'd be happy to do some kind of show. I usually am planned out two years in advance. Um, I do sometimes get little blips in the schedule. There's little interruptions. Not everything falls into place exactly how it was planned, or as you can imagine, there's many other interruptions with COVID. Um, but I said, let me try, and I'll certainly put together a package to share with our exhibition advisory committee. And so um, I was looking at dates and emails to see like how fast did this come together? And um, it was fast <laughs> um, because we end up, because of these multi spaces of our gallery, it's small. It's just like one little wing of this big building. And so I try to activate all of our space as much as possible with little shows. And so what we currently have up in the hall cases is a show by um, Landis Blair and called Mirth and Mayhem, illustrations from Landis Blair. And then in the Rotunda Gallery and South Gallery, we have a national um, 
call for entry show called Storied References. And then in my little North Gallery, I have Ellen's work, um, just a few select pieces. But I needed them to all deal with narrative. And so that was our limitation when I said, Herb, I can do this show if we do it then. And so that committee had approved this last March. In February, I was approached by Aaron Packer and Peter Van Ale from um, the Olson Gallery in the School of Art and Aaron Packer of Packer Projects wanting to do a show in the School of Art with Landis Lair's work of David Carlson's graphic novel called The Hunting Accident. And they said, could you show some other stuff of Landis? And so I was like, okay, I could do that. I didn't show you tons of images from all these others because again, trying to show the images of those shows, they're complicated because of our crazy spaces. But again, we're in this little North gallery. Oh, I do wanna go back one slide then. Hold on, I can use this now to give you a clue of, Here's my craziness of what I'm going to try to show you. Okay. Yeah, we could see that now. Now you see it. I'm so sorry. I know. I love these things. Okay. So, um, anyway, this context of the show, I was approached by Aaron Packer and Peter Van Ale. They wanted to do this. We were approached simultaneously almost. When things happen, they come in waves, right? And we were asked to do, I had a proposal of some artists wanting to do shows on mythology. And I thought, eh? and I even suggested to the committee, do we want to do, I had some money from a donor somewhere down the line. And I'm like, we could show Ellen's work and this Landis Blair work. And we could show, we could rent a David Hackney fairy tale litho series, but it was for some insane amount of money. And they said, no, we're not spending that kind of money, Burke. You can't do that. <laughs> um, but they said, figure out your own show. And so we did this storied references, which is concurrently going on in our rotunda and south galleries. Landis has work in the hall cases. And there was a recording of his gallery talk the other day that will be on our website shortly. So you'll be able to look at that too. Anyway. Now, let's see if I can go forward. Eek. All right, so um, from the mind of Ellen Ross Deutsch, it's on display January 12th, February 26th, at North Gallery, part of this exhibition suite on narratives. I wanna thank a couple people. I don't know if they're here today. Mary Glenn Boyce, who um, is on our exhibition advisory committee. Um, Mary Glenn is an old friend of Ellen's. And so I said, okay, when we do this, I need you to help select some pieces. We're gonna go through this. And um, then we weren't sure, this is all pre-COVID mind you, that we were starting this and approve this. And then um, we ended up doing a lot more um, hornagling as COVID is sort of shifted everything. I want to thank Robert Banke. He's another member of the NIU Art Museum who, of the professional photos that he took of the exhibition. But I used a lot of Herb's photos too. And I have to say, I want to thank Herb. And as an artist, any artist wants to thank Herb because <laughs> the amount of support and um, just, uh, all the work he has done over the years as a partner to Ellen and documenting her work and um, supporting her and all her creative efforts is phenomenal and lovely and wonderful. Um, at a certain point, Herb and I did a Zoom together and he toured me around the house um, because I started planning a show with a lot of the images he shared with us. Um, and then realizing later, like, I'm not gonna be able to get those. Um, some of those pieces are off in, in Africa or in California or wherever. And it was like, we're not going to be able to afford to ship these things or risk shipping them. And so we just said, no, we're going to work with what you got at the house. And there was lots there. Um, so I want to thank Herb. Um, and I also want to thank Ellen. And I just 
grateful to have had an opportunity to work with this her work and display it and I think it's important work that my students at NIU needed to see. So um, there's that smiling girl. Um, I also need to thank um, Jane Stevens. Um, Herb shared with me a catalog from a retrospective show in 2014 at the Illinois State Museum Gallery in Chicago, unfortunately now disappeared. Um, but it that really wasn't a catalog. That was just a book on Ellen's art career that yeah. was independent of the show. Oh, okay. I didn't know how much was carried over in there, but it also had um, essays from um, gallerist Avram, I'll try to butcher the name, Ison, Ison, Ison. Um, and an artist friend, Helene Smith Romer. And I met Ellen when she came out to visit and we had a show up at the NIU Art Museum of Helene Smith Romer's work. That was when I first met her. Um, but anyway, I used the text in that book when I made any labels with um, quotes from Ellen describing the work, I used it from that book, so. Um, Ellen curated a show for us back in 2009 when I first became director of the NIU Art Museum. And um, these were a number of the really pretty phenomenal um, fiber artists that she had in this show. Um, and so it was amazing that she could connect us with these people and get them to participate in this. And it was so much her enthusiasm and love. And I know she had fun going to studios and picking out work. Um, and so we did this exhibit, Crossing Threads, Crossing Boundaries. Um, there were other curatorial projects done by Ellen over the years, Growing Up Female, A Twist on Threads, Unique Editions, Unique Editions, Text Structure and Performance um, at the Art Center in Highland Park. And of course, the four Roth brothers, A Family Continues at NAB Gallery. And I think some of those um, people who might've been in that show may even be on this uh, this Zoom call. Um, and she also co-curated Black Fusion at ARC Gallery in Chicago. And I got to meet her co-curator recently, um, and I'm drawing a blank on her name when she stopped by the show and um, picked up some prints. Um, but we were thinking like, wow, what would that show be like now to see what the Black Fusion show and what are those artists doing now? very interesting. Um, this is just some images in the gallery at the NIU Art Museum of Crossing Threads, Crossing Boundaries. Um, what I could not find, it was an image I had of the gallery talk, and there were probably 50 people in that gallery and jammed in, and I was like, I cannot find those images. So, anyhow. Um, back to the show at hand from the mind of Ellen Roth Deutsch. Um, I focused everything based on this particular piece. And uh, even thinking about the layout in the Little North Gallery coming off of this work, um, this house where Ellen shows herself drawing, um, angels up above her. Um, various rooms showing various art, how important artwork is, dance, and sneaking up behind her, this horrible leopard, um, images from the Holocaust off amongst beyond the chimney and over to the right, all these things continually on her mind in her work. Um, and the fact that this piece, she even seemed to call it different titles at different times. Um, she had told me once it was about depression. Um, will the leopard return? Waiting for when is depression going to hit again? Um, but somewhere I saw she also called it the House of Ellen's Mind. And that's what gave me the title for this show, From the Mind of Ellen Roth Deutsch. Um, I also found it in the book. It's listed as Whom Will the Leopard Strike Next? So titles of pieces are like, oh, wait a minute, you know, and they are work lives on and um, 
it has those things, you know, once the artist lets it go, it's out there and it has its own life and impact on for other people. But this was the piece and I thought about the room in the North Gallery laid out sort of around this. Um, and the approaches I then looked at to seeing in that as a lot of her work based on autobiography. Um, I structured some things around the checkered floor. Um, obviously the dance characters, um, the Holocaust, um, fairy tale and book metaphors, and then body, mind, soul. Soul was really important for Ellen. And that was something that I identified a lot with when we would talk, when we were, she was working on the curation of the um, crossing threads, crossing boundaries. And so this is how I approached the show. And um, again, knowing that many of you know this work probably better. And so I tried to be able to zoom in on some things, but um, this piece with autobiography, even including a cartoon here and the death ribbon from her dad when he died in um, 1981. But it's then the cartoon says, and let me see if this thing works. Um, I don't need a slide rule to do my homework. I use Herbie. Um, and again, thanks for <laughs> every artist needs a Herbie. Um, but this would have been a cartoon that her father did. Um, and that one of those shows that her sent me this and it just arrived on Friday afternoon was the catalog for the um, four Roth brothers at Family Continues. Um, so the four brothers up at the top, which could be relatives of some of you guys, um, Al Ross, Ben Roth, Irving Roth, and Salo. Um, these guys who all cartooned and laughed together, um, were instructors for the professional school of cartooning in New York. And um, obviously um, helped spawn an incredibly creative family because when Ellen put together the show with the family continues that there were like seven out of eight cousins who were actively involved in artwork. Um, I come from a family of artists as well. And so this was something that you know, we sort of jive together on. So, um, but always in that humor and that way of looking at things was there. Um, several pieces where Ellen early on was doing her cast paper and acrylic. And again, they were autobiographical showing the old apartment um, on Kruger Avenue. Um, a day in the park, some of the denizens and neighbors of the park there in the um, Bronx, as well as this one that cast paper acrylic, the meeting, which is in the exhibition. And I was, I wanted the meeting to be shown so that students would see um, some of the things that it showed. It gave me a way to share um, that she was, this was a group from the Panel of American Women, PA, and Ellen was a presenting panelist well, shortly after graduate school in North Carolina. Um, PA was a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religion uh, women's group dedicated to ending all forms of prejudice. And then later when Ellen and at the same time was an early activist of the National Organization of Women and would be an active member of Chicago Women's Caucus for the Arts and the ARC Gallery, a women's co-op gallery and the Countryside Arts Center, CAC in Arlington Heights. Um, once they, she and Herb and the growing family moved to the Chicago area. Um, it just seemed particularly important to for students to see this part of her history. Um, other autobiographical where she did these rather coquettish fans, and we'll kind of zoom in on some of these, um, where she looks at life and does sort of a timeline by the decades through these. And, you know, this one starts in the um, 
be not the best focus always. Come back. Wait. There's let's see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. I know it ends in 90. Yeah, so it starts in 40. And she's born in what? 1940. Um, so you can kind of see. Does that work for you guys? Um, influences, when obviously getting married, things going off, working probably at the Abbott Labs there. So, um, just rather wonderful ways of showing. Um, this one where it's focused on dance. So it's sort of a preview of, whoa, come back here. Some of the other um, pieces where she deals with dance as well, but here showing all different styles and as well dance through the arrows, it seems like. And then um, still these, these skeletons here and the angels and fairies and magical stuff all there. All I think it's on the lower right are actually cast paper and attached. Yeah, yeah. So collaging those on there. Anyway, so we had those in there. Um, and then I did this other little structure with her checkered floor, which I had to laugh at. And Mary Glenn responded to the checkered floor as well. I don't know if Mary Glenn is here today, but she said, I've used checkered patterns too. Um, and I just thought it was such an interesting way to try to organize a piece, these complex scenes that it helps to add perspective, it adds depth, it adds, but it also was like a way of, you know, trying to force some sort of control over all these characters. <laughs> you know, um, These are pieces that we did not get in the show. I know some of these, this one, Dorothy wants to go home, excuse me, that's up here. Um, one of the daughters, I think, has this, or a cousin or a niece, maybe. Um, and I'm not sure about this one. These all have been sold. Her work is scattered throughout and all over the world. Um, playing the game, I think, is one that um, Beth has in Africa. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and at first I was like, I need that one, her. And it's like, yeah, well, and then of course during COVID, it's like, yeah, you can't get things shipped in and you can't. And I also thought so many of these are one of a kind. I can't risk having them shipped. And they were talking about how the mail was going. They were talking about all this. And I thought, no, we're just not doing that. But I thought it was important to see there was this pattern like, and that it needed to be shown somehow. And I thought, well, we're going to be doing this virtually. So it gives me an opportunity to show that it really is an important element in how she structured and organized. Um, the pieces that we did include in the show. So this is an installation shot. Um, and I'll zoom in on some of these. The three dancers with trees, um, a different form of dance being shown with nature, but again, with the um, uh, checkered floor down there, and also some painting on this frame, which is something that she does in some of the other ones that we've seen, or we'll see. Um, And this other one, the reunion, and I'm curious now, after I've seen a few of you, um, if some of this is referring to a family reunion, talks about the book of life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. So some of you get more abstracted, some of you get your characters like, ah. Oh. Interesting. So, and some of these we don't have accurate dates. We just kind of go post 2014, you know, and some we have dates and they're very precise. Um, anyway, wonderful. Um, so, then again, this is a little tiny gallery. <laughs> so, Echoes of the Dance and this poem that Ellen 
wrote, which is from the like codicil at the beginning of the um, a bound set. And these are like shots taken in our back room. Pete Olson took these of this lovely set of velvet set of these prints. Uh, listen, listen to the silence, to the spaces between words, to the silence of your soul. You can hear him too. Shouts in the night, loud laughter or little smiles, shoulders shaking with mirth. Call him trickster, joker, death. Like froggy comes a courtin' as lover, enemy, friend. And this actually is this whole series of these prints. I haven't tried zooming in. I won't be able to tell you the names of each one there, her. But um, so these lithographs that were done, and um, these are like from 1996. We only were able to put a couple of these up in the gallery. Um, so I have them on the sides of these big crazy wall. These are like six foot by two foot thick walls. Or, eight and a half foot high. Um, so Star Catcher is the one on the top in the series. And here's a colored pencil version of it that we did not show, but from a file slide that Herb had shot. And then the other one on the bottom, all that jazz from the Echoes of the Dance. And then I think I flipped to the other side of the wall and um, sorry. Um, and on this side, heartthrob on the um, lower left on here, and the colored pencil version, as well as then on the top, true to her nature from Echoes of the Dance. And I've had students pick which ones we would show. Um, I kind of like to give them as much involvement with that as possible. And I thought it was a little too tight and hard to see if I did them three stacked. So I only did them two stacked. And so I did them one. These are some others from the series um, of colored pencils of this dance. So important for such a major opus of work. Um, these are ones that are not in the show. These are all belong to somebody and are loved. And like the downtown one is part of the Illinois State Museum, but down in Springfield now. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to go there. So, um, the ones that we could show, um, um, and I thought this is one I hadn't seen before, the red dress coming to her, that we see her in all the time and like the delivery of the red dress, it seemed like such a um, intriguing, interesting um, way of, here, this is what you're gonna need to get through life. <laughs> you know, you're gonna need this. And it's like, okay. Um, I don't have a close up of the other one, Awakening, but Comfort, lovely. Sometimes these dancers are comforting and sometimes they're kind of spooky because sometimes she's with death and sometimes she's with, it's a struggle. Um, so this one, I think had been in Herb's office in Rockford, um, Exit, let's see if we can see. Quite as focused, but and a lot of these same things as wonderful stars, things that are showing, and they're exiting out back there, through there, um, as well. This very dramatic dance. And rescue. Um, Again, it's on the stage set with, and I thought it was interesting then another one that's not quite with dance, but it had the same kind of color and theme and whatnot. It was one that we 
didn't get to borrow it. It belongs um, to the Whiteson family. Um, fly away, but it seemed to correspond a good deal with this, the rescue um, with these two other angelic uh, characters leading the woman in the red dress on. Um, again, because this was supposed to be a narrative series, I did heavy on books. This book, however, I couldn't figure out how to show. And it was one though that Mary Glenn had particularly was like, oh, this one's really great. We need this one. And I'm like, I don't know how to do it other than in the program. <laughs> um, because Herb had some other copies of stuff, but it, I prefer to show originals in the gallery. And um, it was a single book, you know, bound with wire. And um, it tells a story, this memory of language. Hold on, I can go back and move my Zoom. Um, talking about, um, and I'm going to forgive my big face as I get closer here. Um, in 1950, when I was nine, we lived on a lake in the Catskill Mountains, renting cool air and water to city people fleeing the concrete summer heat. Then the night sky was crowded with stars, the only air traffic from bees, gnats, and butterflies sharing space around white rose-filled trellis. Sid and Fred danced, Esther swam, and Dorothy went to Oz, while we children splashed and ran, filling buckets with blueberries and tadpoles. Two families came that year with three children and a baby named Irving. Blue numbers tattooed on their arms. They spoke in a tongue familiar but not understood, reminiscent of conversation among grandparents around tables filled with food. Standing at the edge of the shimmering gray water, they breathed in air made fragrant by lilac and cooled by tall trees, the oldest residents of our colony. On a housetop nearby, a weather vane creaked, moved by a rush of summer wind, looking up their fragile faces, shattered with fear by a glimpse of the black image, remembering pain, souls lost, smells of death and camp of ashes. Sounds from their rapid tongues filled the air as they fought to stay in 1958. Our parents accommodated and soothed in order to keep them there. That summer, their children joined us in play. We taught them baseball and jump rope, monopoly and English. They taught us history and Yiddish, and the miles were bridged. Ich like der, I like you. Ich like der nicht. I don't like you. Ich bin verliebt mit der. I'm in love with you. Ich bin verliebt mit der nicht. I am not in love with you. There was more, but this is all I remember. On the 4th of July, we stood together on the porch of the old red house, watching light and color explode in remembrance of an older war. Eating hot dogs and sauerkraut, they laughed to be there, but I don't think they ever felt safe. Maybe Irving would. Elma Birch. Um, another book project of Ellen's was Mr. Swift and the Brown Shoes. And um, this was a pretty major project for her. Um, here it is, tied with shoelaces. Um, we have a book copy in the display case in the gallery um, with a couple pages exposed. And um, this is one where she talks about 
this a little bit. Mr. Swift and the Brown Shoes is a fairy tale about the loss of power and self-esteem due to sexual molestation. It features a heroine who goes on a search for the sturdy brown shoes that were taken from her as a young child. It has an empowering ending. In my work, I use different parts of myself, the little girl, the dancer, etc. Sometimes I use a spider web or threads to show that all is connected. In the final version of this book, I use spider webs from one page to the next. And so in the gallery, what we had was um, an installation of some of the preparatory sketches she did. It's these beautiful, lush um, drawings. And then they were done um, on an artist residency at Ragdale Foundation in 1992. And then the next year she did uh, wrote a grant proposal got the opportunity to go work and print some of the books at um, Artist Bookworks in 1993. And some of the character in this thing is where this little girl gets to be um, heroic and gets to go after this evil character, Mr. Swift. Um, and he's stolen away her um, sturdy brown shoes that made it easy for her to get around. Right? Um, and she finds him as she seeks him out that he's actually been whitewashing all these little girls brown shoes. And she manages to flip the whitewash on him again with some help from above. Um, but again, it's this image that it's quite disturbing. Um, you get that reminiscence of the Holocaust images that you saw in the um, House of Ellen's Mind, or Will the Leopard Return, where you see that lineup of people to the right, you see all these vulnerable characters. But here she got to fight back. And um, this is something that this young child female gets to do repeatedly in Ellen's stories. Um, for her small child to carry forward. Um, so again, like how was I organizing this? Um, again, with fairy tales and book metaphors. Um, again, as I was trying to link these to the shows, I waited a bit until we had our national call for entry. Um, I wanted to see what kind of work we would have in that so there'd be correspondences and um there was a lot of artists who worked with fairy tales and so I was like okay here we go not knowing that a lot of the fairy tale work would have also been sold and was not available but these are ones that show her humor um and a good feminist take on some of these things that need to be seen um so I hope you can read this when Sleeping Beauty woke up, she was 50 years old. By then, it was almost over. I love her hair. Um, this one of a slumber party of princesses. Someday my prince will come. Snow White, Rose Red, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty had a pajama party and talked about whether they really would ever live happily ever after, given the present divorce rate. And then Little Red Riding Hood met the wolf. There was something familiar about him. Was he her grandfather, uncle, father, brother, neighbor? Or is danger here? You can see two little red riding hoods. Whoops, sorry. One is always observing. Um, these are all egg tempera, um, 15 by 11. And then there was a whole wonderful series of where she would retell some of these fairy tales that we're familiar with. I just picked a couple of the last scenes from Cinderella. Um, zoom in here. So here's the prince, right? And here even you have that observation again, um, little girl watching. It's over here as well. 
Um, but when it came time to slip on the shoe, she had second thoughts about what to do. She thought about choices until the dawn brought the light. It's hard to refuse when you're supposed to be just right. Good for a night, good for a dance, but that was it. And then this other one is from Rumpelstiltskin. This is just her final scene. Who has the power here? The miller's daughter needs some of her own. Um, so you see all these other characters from this, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, the miller, the prince, they're all making negotiations about stuff. And she's like, wait, it's not happening. So um, again, um, and these corresponded quite a bit. We have some people who have um, taken Red Riding Hood and retold some of those stories as well in the story reference. We have some others who picked up on some others. Um, so there was some overlap. Um, this was actually after, happily ever after, I think this is actually the box cover where some of those other um, panels fit in. And the last I think was Claire Prussian, uh, the artist had these in her possession. And hopefully have been inherited by someone who appreciates them. Um, and again, with the observation. So I ended up thinking I was going to do a lot more fairy tales, and I only had these few. <laughs> um, there was one other herb shared with me, and I was like, it just isn't as developed as far. And so I didn't use it. Um, so, and I get to blame Mary Glenn when I'm like, no, I kept that up. That's always part of the exhibition committee, is they get blamed when they make decisions. Um, so we have uh, versions of Red Riding Hood meeting um, the wolf or meeting Mr. Swift at a family party, all these overlapping things, Rumpelstiltskin and Humpty Dumpty, and they're all quite dark. Um, and then you see images that are difficult to deal with. And again, these are things that I know we have students on campus who are needing to deal with and traumas. Um, um, Seeing an artist cope with these things is really important. That you can find ways to grapple. Um, and I also thought there was a lot of correspondence here visually going on between these two works over various decades. Um, one of a really major big piece, um, Alice in Wonderland. And this was intriguing to me because it's one that she kept going back to. Uh, partly because it was so big, but also, um, you know, it's just so complicated. And, you know, you can kind of see some of these, all the different characters and overlaps of different things. There's the guy, you know, smoking his, uh, the caterpillar, um, but out on the city and the rat. And I think this guy's probably playing the blues. I think he's playing a harmonica. Um, the metro and of course we see the staging again and the Roxy and the Rock Hats and New York and just all these things in life that you know the crazy story of Alice in the Wonderland and I think there must have been some nice correspondence for Ellen with the adventures. Um, this was a more recent piece and I, fairy tales and other strange things. And again, she's got some cast paper collage on here. Um, so you get some of that dimensionality as well. Um, some things from nature, just these crazy plants that look like fingers and a witch and a little dwarf and all sorts of characters. And then you have again, these um, painting on the frame, little drawings. And uh, sometimes try to see, you know, that looks like to me the, the woman's derriere and some uh, lace tights there. Um, so back in the gallery, so let's see how those all fit together. Um, some of these others were narrative series. I hope we're doing okay. I'm going off a long here. Um, this one was important of 
on not being able to breathe from 1993. Um, and I actually went out and dug up some new pine needles to put in there. Um, but then I wasn't sure if they would hurt the piece. And so I didn't use them. I used the old um, uh, dried pines that uh, Herb had in a bag. And I saw that they were used that same way in another photo um, of them. And so I thought it's okay to use. But she talked about the smell even being a part of that. And when you don't see that there, it's sort of different. Um, they were going to be under glass anyway, so I didn't think they would necessarily smell the same in there. Um, but Ellen's note says that on not being able to breathe is composed of five cast paper pages that tell the story of a rape and the consequent loss of a soul. The pages are contained in a decorated box with a coffin-like shape. The odor of the pine is evocative of the memory. And she was on her way home. Suddenly there were three of them, older boys from the neighborhood. They had a big knife. They pushed her down backwards, covering her mouth and nose with a hand, palm flat. She was no match for them. Afterward, she fled home, but couldn't get in. Her soul died that day. Um, and I know that the idea about soul again and again, and when you talk about depression and a sense of your soul leaving, um, not even being present in your body anymore, is uh, something that Ellen and I did get to share and talk about in the time. Um, another one of these um, stories that's pretty rough, um, my, A, my name is Audrey from 1989. And this one, she said, my name is Audrey deals with loneliness and confusion that comes with sexual abuse within a family. This story was told to me. Um, so there's this box of toys and a little girl with her legs spread. And um, there's a religious as well as a cross, um, little balls, little blocks with the letters from A, my, from Audrey spelling out her name. Um, these rather dark images. Audrey was only seven when it first began. Her stepfather would give her a cue and she would know to go to his bed while he pretended to be asleep. Everyone else, her mother, her grandmother, her sisters would leave the house to go shopping. She would go to his bed and he would touch her and do things. She wasn't afraid because it felt good. She knew it was a secret between them. When she was 12, her stepfather became afraid. He said it was all her fault and they had done what they had done and that she had made him do it to her. She said, he said, she better not tell her mother about it or else he'd tell everybody what a bad girl she was. Not too long afterwards, he went to Vietnam and died in a fire. She wasn't sorry at all. Um, I picked some other story narratives that were a little happier as well. Um, and so this one called Transformation Dream um, is uh, these small panels on Masonite. And Ellen writes, I dreamt the story twice, so I decided it was important to paint. The first block out of four shows a handicapped woman on crutches who observes a two-year-old little girl heading for the water. She is frightened because she knows her priority is to save the child, but she doesn't know if her body is capable. In block two and three, she does save the child and gives her back to her mother. In block four, she magically loses her crutches and turns into a tortoise, able to swim freely down the river, not handicapped at all. And so I have this piece above the um, A, my name is Audrey, just the idea that being able to handle these things and solve these things. Um, this other one on this back wall, uh, that's also pretty nice, is In the Hands of God. Um, 
2012, and Ellen notes, uh, in the hands of God is reminiscent of a fairy tale, a young woman with small wings, is she an angel or Betty, is being chased by a strange man and sees no escape. Suddenly, she sees a white horse, but before she mounts him, she sees the hand of God far away. On the other side of the river in the sky, what to do? She then mounts the horse and flies upward over the river to God. She is finally safe. Um, so again, body, mind, soul, and sickness and in health. Um, again, I first thought I wanted these two together, um, really powerful pieces targeted has been distributed to someone I don't recall. I didn't put down where things were because sometimes they go on to another generation or um, I figured that was private and I didn't need to put that. But so that targeted was not in our show, but we do have nature lady. And if I can zoom in on these, they're really pretty stunning. Um, and Again, showing all this, and this was some of the things done when she was having trouble with her back um, as well. And you see this is a figure that will end up looking like some of the um, organs that will be shown later on. As, um, um, and then these like triangles, like with the Holocaust as well, and these marked for different people of targeted communities being marked. And this sure looks to me, it says fragile. It looks like someone, I don't know if they're lynched, <laughs> but this is uh, an intriguing, difficult piece that she was working on. Um, again, you still see the problems with the back, um, but looking at nature, and these lovely um, bits of nature on there. I know there was some comment in the um, the book from Dark to Light with Humor, where Ellen talks about you know nature being such a concern, and a lot of it was um, you know we're having these like frogs with extra legs and environmental concerns going on and you know are we losing our bees are we losing you know certain butterflies all these different things that are like where is all that in here um so it seemed to be one way that she was able to try to deal with those things so, gallery though we have uh nature lady next to this group of women. I thought that was kind of a nice way to keep together. And then I put in like two self portraits. Um, so one is a stack from her um, beaded organ series. Um, and then the other is a small drawing. Um, and I her and I'm sorry if I'm saying this, it said, oh, Ellen thought that was a little too personal. She wasn't sure she wanted that one out there. But I thought it was such a beautiful drawing. And when I was laying out the show, this is one spot where Mary Glenn really like, no, I don't want anything else too close to that. It needed its own spot. And I had it stacked with something else originally. And she was like, no, this has to be solo. So, um, I just have, I think this is Herb's shadow here in front of the brain. <laughs> um, these are from the beads on silk. Um, and there's a, quite a series of these that was done. And so I have some others here, the vertebrae, which you can see in um, that piece called targeted. Um, but these precious organs were created by Ellen in 2006. Um, and she worked on an extensive series of these while recuperating from surgery, following along as her daughter, Dr. Gail Ochtoich, was doing research on how 
undifferentiated embryonic cells from mice form organs. Um, the series allowed Ellen to incorporate her own scientific background um, with a BS in biology, chemistry, and a master's in microbiology, biochemistry, and years of work in labs in medical centers with the arts. And, uh, they're really stunning pieces. Uh, and again, either distributed to art collectors or on display um, at the uh, Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. Well, they have four of them. Four of them. Yeah, they're really quite stunning. And when Ellen was working on um, crossing threads, crossing boundaries for us, she shared with me these and said, I, can we show these sometime? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and again, it's always hard to get a show with us because we have such weird space and weird overlaps, but so I was pleased to be able, and I thought brain, eye, female organs as an artist, you know, that kind of showed so much of who she was. So I, to me, that was like her self-portrait right there. Um, and then next to it is this image. Um, self-image after knee replacement sometime 2006-2007. I just found that laying down in the artist room in the basement. <laughs> uh, I didn't remember her doing this, yeah. but it seems like an important one. And it, it yeah. profiled her with the medical and the art and needlepoint and it was like a just her in totality almost done <laughs> um a couple of newer pieces i oh, oops, only included the one on the left um cloudscapes um these down. I just loved all these crazy characters and things in the sky. And um, my label for that just said, um, you know, this is what artists see when they look at the sky. <laughs> um, there's another yeah, it was one. framed after Ellen died. Oh, yeah. And another one, um, throw me to the clouds. Again, this little girl watching, she's, she's like Barracudas. Um, and again, both seem to have been done in the 2019. Um, I felt just because I had so many gloomy and dark things in this that it was nice to see something else that was bright and beautiful and colorful. So. Herb had lots of other images. I didn't put these in the show because, again, I was looking at stories and trying to deal with certain things that um, with the story reference show where we asked artists to use stories to talk about contemporary issues, and a lot of them dealt with difficult issues and violence against women and other things. Um, I kept to those other stories, but this is just such a beautiful thing. And, um, I really love her landscapes. Otherwise, I don't know. It's, several beautiful, but this is the only one I did put in just to this um, PowerPoint. Um, and of course, I thought it was so delightful um, instead of dancing with the joker or the devil or the skeletons in whatever regard those might represent, but to see um, her and Ellen together in a shipboard romance um, and they were on a cruise. Um, this was done in 2019. And seems to me the way that all of those dances should end. Um, and then the last little wall of the gallery has um, two pieces about the theater since that's such an important part of Ellen's life and how she looked at things and um, approached and so there's this one from uh, Lloyd's Paradise Theater in the Bronx and then this other which was an unfinished piece um, I believe Beth titled this one Last Curtain Call and so I just will 
zoom in on some of these. Um, oops, sorry. And in this other from the, the theater in 1956, and you can see maybe, you know, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Grace Kelly, um, High Society, John Wayne, Natalie Wood, The Searchers. Coming attraction with Kim Novak and William Holden. <laughs> Wonderful. And I think this theater was also just renovated not that long ago. They were working on this. And it's been saved. And again, this for skies. Fabulous. Um, lush um, colored pencil on this one. There had been a cast paper version of Lowe's Paradise Theater as well. Um, and there were some um, gifle prints done of this as well, which I pretty spectacular. Um, and then just this last one, um, I love that title. Um, this, I think, um, seemed to be possibly based on the Coronado Theater in Rockford. I had some note about it. Okay. If anybody says something to me, it just it stays in there and some crazy. So I hope I got those all right. I believe um, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once we believe it, her. No, it's true. It is true. It is true. Yeah, yeah she was working on a theater theory. She had done uh, the Chicago theater. She that was a finished print, and she was working on this, but she died before it was finished. Yeah. But, but Beth love... said it's done. I want it, and we framed it. Yeah, it's quite large. It's it's really pretty spectacular, and I just love this. I can't get any closer on this, but you know, there's that character. She's right there, just peeking outside the curtain. That's the last of what I have, and I was just going to end right there. So um, I don't know if we have um, questions that I'm probably not the person who can answer, or if you have, uh, you guys just want to be freed up to talk. And Stuart, if you're able to release the microphones. <laughs> yeah, are there are there any questions about the presentation? I'm not seeing any. I've, I've been monitoring the, the chat and there's been wonderful comments and conversation that's been happening. Um, so I'm I'm happy to help moderate some of those questions. Otherwise, um, Joe, if you have any final comments. Um, no, just thank you. I appreciate, you know, it, it, I, Ellen was, I wish I'd gotten to know her even better and more, but I'm pleased that I got to uh, work with her when we did do the one curation. And um, she's just a funny, sweet, good spirit. And I know when we were working on this, I kind of said to her, she'll let us know if any of this is wrong. <laughs> So anyway, thank you for. I thank you, Joe, for doing all of this. It, it's, I think it's a great honor to her memory and I'm so grateful for you for doing this. <laughs> You're very welcome.